Good morning again, church. I pray everyone is already blessed so far by the service and God's presence. The message this morning is abiding in the love of Christ. Abiding in the love of Christ. Bow with me for a word of prayer. Father God, we are gracious to be gathered here this morning in your house. You have called sinners to yourself. You have provided a way of salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. You have given us your Holy Spirit that we may understand your word. Now, O oh God, may you send your word forward and may it, may, may it accomplish the purpose for which you have sent it. May it not return back to you void, but may it convict hearts this morning. May it strengthen us. May it encourage us. May it conform us to the very image of Jesus Christ. And may you be glorified in your church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We would have just read John chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. And I know everyone knows this song, Christ Alone, Cornerstone. So I don't know if everyone could sing it with me this morning, if we could all sing it together. I'm not the best singer. You know, people tell me I'm tone deaf, but um, I still love to sing to the Lord, eh? So... If you tone deaf like me, I still want you to sing. <laughs> but let's sing it together. Christ alone. Weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. Sing it one more time. Christ alone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord. Okay, this is the last time. One more time. I love that song. And you know, we just sang those verses, Christ alone, cornerstone. Weak made strong in the Savior's love. But the question this morning is, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that weak sinners are made strong in the Savior's love? Last week, we talked about what is a true Christian. And we talked about a Christian as someone who is in Christ, who has benefited from the life of Christ. He has been taken out of the, the dead works of Adam. And now he is placed in this Christ who is the life-given vine, the true vine. And the Christian is someone who is bearing the fruit of Christ's spirit because he has received the Holy Spirit. One of the main fruit of that spirit is love. And that's what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. You know, when the Apostle Paul mentions the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the first fruit he mentions is what? Love. In Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And if you count these fruits, he mentions nine different fruits that come from this one Holy Spirit. Right? But in the, verse, in, the, in the verses that we just read, John chapter 15, verses 9 to 17, 
Jesus mentions just love nine times. I've loved you. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. And it's always love, 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 love. What Jesus wants us to know is that a major part of the fruit that, he, that, that the Christians will show in, in, in this true vine is love. And then he wants us to know how important it is for us to abide in this love. Not just talk about it, not just sing about it, but literally abide in his love. It is important for us to understand that this is the love that's going to make our Christian strong. You know, what is the substance of this love? Why is this love so important? Well, it's not a selfish love. It's not a created love. It's not a mere natural love that Jesus is talking about. You see, this love is this love that always existed in the Trinity. Before all worlds, Father, Son, and Spirit are dwelling in perfect love. It is the very powerhouse of the Trinity. And when God loves, he loves us from his very being. You see, it's a love that has no beginning and it has no end. It just is. So when Adam sinned and, uh, you know, sin was unleashed on the earth, God was not in fear. He was abiding in love. And when he looked at us in our sins, John 3 says, verse 16 says, For God so what? Loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, that love, it moved God to send his only begotten son into a world like this. That we should not perish but believe in Jesus Christ. That we who believe in him should not perish. So Jesus wants us to understand that this love is a supernatural love. It's not something that we could create. It's not something that we could get on our own. It's something that he gives us freely. And why is he so concerned about telling these disciples about this love? Well, because he knows the trials that they're going to face. You see, he knows when he leaves what's going to happen. The world that crucified him, these disciples will now have to live in that world. A very hostile one. And he tells us this later on in John 15, in the same chapter, verses 18 to 20, he tells his disciples, if the world hates you, know that it would hated me before it hated you. And if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, remember he took you and put you in Christ, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world what? Hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen to these disciples. He knows exactly what's going to happen to all of us as we abide in him. We have to face this hostile world. So in, with that in mind, he says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. And then Jesus thinks about these trials that his people will have to face, and then he tells them, abide in my love. So the first question we need to ask ourselves today is, how did the Father love the Son? Because Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Well, how did the Father love the Son? Perfectly. In fact, there was never a time when the Father did not love the Son. You see, the Father loved the Son perfectly, and, 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 and this love is dependable. It's reliable. Jesus is the very object of the Father's love. And that love is what caused Jesus to endure the cross. He fixed his eyes on the Father's love. And because of that, the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So the next question is, he says, as the Father has loved him, he is loving us with that same love, that same supernatural love. So how does Jesus love his true disciples? With the same love that the Father loved him. Now I want you to get this. Jesus is holy. The Father is holy. There's no sin in Jesus. So when the Father loves Jesus, it's a holy love. But when Jesus loves us, we're not holy. 
We don't measure up. But he loves us as though we were already holy. It's an unconditional love. You see, what, ama- what, amazes, what amazes me is the fact that Jesus could still love us when we don't measure up. You see, Jesus went to the cross. Not only did he endure the hatred of this world, but the same disciples who we are saying that he is loving them just as the Father loved him, the same disciples will leave him. They will forsake him. And in spite of all that opposition, you know how Jesus responds? He loves them. So so he tells us in John 13 verse 1, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world, to the Father. How did he love his disciples? Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I want you to get that this morning. Jesus' love for us is not growing. He loved us while we were yet sinners. While we were enemies, he loved us. That same love is the love that he consistently loves us with throughout our Christian walk. It is a love that is just like how the Father loved him. And that ought to just cause us to just thank the Father this morning. Aren't you happy that God is not like man? His love is not conditional. It's unconditional. And I think as sometimes as Christians, we forget that. You see, his love never fails. It is the same love that Paul speaks about. In 1 Corinthians 13 verse 7, it is the same love that bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. And it endures all things. It is this unconditional love that Jesus wants us to abide in as his true disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now just stay there. Abide in that. Dwell on that. Think about his love for you. Why is this important? Because Jesus knows we're going to need it. And Jesus... You know what Jesus spends the last few hours of his time doing before he goes to the cross? He spends it in John 17 praying that we would be perfect in this love. Think about how important that is. Of all the things Jesus could pray about, read it to me in John 17 verse 25 to 26. This is what he says. Oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know you that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name. And I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. So Jesus is praying for the infinite, supernatural, powerful love in the Trinity to be in the believer. That's what he's praying for. So he knows this love that is always there in the Trinity. And he says, look, Father, I know how powerful this love is. I want my people to live in that. Jesus wants us to share in this eternal love. And do you know the Father answered that prayer? On the day of Pentecost, the Father and the Son, they sent the Holy Spirit. And you know what the Holy Spirit is doing? He is pouring out the love of God in our hearts. You see, you ask these disciples who, 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 who Jesus is talking to in John 15. Man, they were hopeless when Jesus died. Peter went back to fishing. They had no hope left in, the, in, in this message of the gospel. But on the day of Pentecost, they received the Holy Spirit. And they went into a world that was hostile, that crucified Jesus, and they preached the gospel boldly. My question to you this morning is, what changed? Well, we know the Holy Spirit dwelt in them. But what exactly did the Holy Spirit do? Well, let's read it. In Romans 5, verse 5, Paul tells us, this is the peculiar thing about the Christian. He can glory in tribulations. Why? Because hope does not put us to shame. Because what? God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Do you get it? That the Christian has the Trinity, the love in the Trinity pouring out in his heart, endless, 
infinite, supernatural. That's what gave those disciples boldness to preach his name. Because for the first time, they understood this love. And their heart started to beat with the love of the Trinity. Jesus is telling these disciples they need to abide in this love. It is the Holy Spirit that produces this fruit. It cannot come from us. It has to come from him. So three things are going to happen when we abide in this love. And Jesus gives it to us. In John 15 verse 10 to 12, he says, You will keep his commandments. As you abide in his love, you will keep his commandments. And then he says, Your joy will be full. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you. Well, how are we going to get his joy? Well, we have, we have to have his spirit. And the fruit of the spirit is his love, peace, joy. So these fruit is coming out of the Christian life because of Jesus' spirit living in us. And he is saying, look, you're going to keep my commandments. Your joy is going to be um, 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 full. And then verse 12 it says, you're going to love one another as I love you. The Father, as the Father loved Jesus, he loves us. Now we got the Holy Spirit, and now we got the love of the Father, the love of the Son, the Spirit pouring out this love in our hearts so we can love one another just as he has loved us. And that's basically what the Christian is supposed to be doing. So the question is this. The question we have before us is this this morning. If the Christian who is abiding in Christ has been given the Holy Spirit, who is pouring out the love of God that eternally exists in the Trinity, in every believer. How come we don't see this love in such a greater display in the lives of Christians? I mean, I mean, think about it. Like you got this, you know, like let's say you turn the tap water on and you got this hose that's connected to the tap water. And that, you, that water is just infinitely on. <sighs> just flooding. What, what could stop that? Well, you know, sometimes when you bottleneck the hose, it's not because the water isn't flowing, it's because there's a blockage. And what I've found is that there's a blockage going on in a lot of Christians' hearts. You think, you, you see, I think it's a matter of focus. The reason we do not love others the way Christ loved us is because we're not focused on the way Christ loved us. We make the mistake in our Christian walk of focusing on our love for God. Or we focus on how much we love ourselves. You see, if you focus on anything from us that is natural, it's going to run out. But the love that we are to focus on is his love that is infinite. That never runs out. You know, Jesus had this conversation with the woman at the well in John chapter 4, verse 13 to 14. He said, uh, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Well, how is that possible? Because the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's the life of the spirit that he is describing. He is describing the Holy Spirit as just pouring out this spring of water into the Christian heart, this life-giving water. And then John 7, he mentions this, this same analogy again. He uses it in John 7, verse 30 to 39. He says, whoever believes in me, that's the true Christian, as the Spirit said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So it ain't coming from us. This he said about the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. So we are supposed to be focusing on this love that God has shown us in Christ. And we need to love others from this river of living waters. You know what's so powerful about this love? Jesus was able to endure the cross by focusing on, on, on the same love that exists in the Father. You realize that, I mean... Jesus was in this world, and he had the will of the Father to do. He had to die for sins. But you could imagine if Jesus was actually focused on the love of the disciples for him. Imagine if he was focusing on Peter's love for him. How much 
How much passion do you think Jesus would have had to go to the cross with? You see, Jesus tells us this. He tells us the secret to how he endured the cross. He focused on the joy that was set before him. He focused on the Father's love. He remembered it, that love that he shared before our worlds. And that drove him to bear the cross. In John 16, verse 32, he says, Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it, is, it has come. He tells the disciples, When you will all be scattered, each to his own home. And, I will, and, and, and they will leave Jesus alone. But he says, Yet I am not alone. Why? For the Father is with me. You see, Jesus never lost sight of the Father's love for him. And that motivated him to endure the cross. And what I'm telling you this morning is, that's the secret to living in a hostile world. That's the secret when trials come in our lives. It says, you know, Jesus found his strength in the Father's love for him. We find our strength in, in, in Christ's love for us. And we need to understand this is an unconditional love. Jesus says, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You see, some Christians have wrongly believed that Jesus is saying in this verse, if you obey my commandments, then I will give you my love. But if you disobey my commandments, then I will remove my love. That's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus loves us unconditionally, and it is not a love that's based on performance. It's not like how we love as humans, and we say, well, I'm going to do this for you once you do this for me. Jesus loved us when we were completely disobedient for him, to him. So Jesus is saying, focus on his love for us. And you know, there was a man named Peter, Apostle Peter, in the Bible, and something happened in Peter's life. Before he denied Jesus three times, Peter boasted in his love for Christ. He was boasting in how much he would never do what Jesus said he was going to do. Because he was so focused on how much he loved Jesus. You know, G Peter denied Jesus three times. You know, three times Jesus came when he restored Peter and he asked him this question, Peter... Do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Remember, Peter? You said that you love me more than all this? Peter, do you love me? The reason Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me, is because he wanted Peter to see he had the wrong focus. Peter should have never been focused on how much he loved Jesus, but how much Jesus loved him. And John, who writes about love, you know what he calls himself in the Gospel of John? The disciple whom Jesus loved. John had a special revelation of the love of God. He just looked at how much Jesus loved him, and he just stood there. He just abided in that. He, he soaked in that. It just permeated his very life. When Jesus is saying, abide in me, abide in my love, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus is saying, focus on my love, and then keeping my commandments will be easy. That's what he's saying. He's saying, let the love and grace that I've shown you so move you that it'll be easy for you to forgive. If you focus on how much Jesus forgave you, man, it'll be easy to forgive your spouse. We're talking about, you know, uh, you know when you're married, it's like you have these, these arguments about crazy stuff. Like, you mad because your wife left the milk out of the fridge, and you wake up in the morning and it's spoiled. And that gets you pissed off the whole day. You know, you know what the problem is? It ain't that she left the milk out of the fridge. It's the fact that you didn't know, that Je you forgot that Jesus loved you when you was a sinner. Oh, when you get that revelation, you go in the store, you buy another milk. You, you don't even talk about it. Then your wife will ask you, well, I thought it was only a little bit left in the milk. How come this milk like this? Don't worry about it, baby. Jesus got you. <laughs> you see, the problem is we're focusing on the wrong thing, man. 
And Jesus said, if you focus on my love for you, man, it'll be easy for you to keep my commandments. And then he says in verse 11, guess what's going to happen? These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you. You will have a fruitful relationship with your wife. You'll have joy in the house. Instead of being miserable about spoiled milk. So, you know, when we focus on Jesus' love for us, we could do amazing things with the trials in life. This same Peter, who denied him three times, his fear was dying for Jesus. <laughs> do you know he was actually crucified upside down for Jesus? He went back in the world, and when they wanted to crucify him for preaching the gospel, he said, no, crucify me upside down. Well, what is the difference between Peter got it? Peter finally got it. That, 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 that focusing on Jesus' love, I can endure any trial. You see, there's no fear in this love in the Trinity. There's no fear in perfect love. Because perfect love, what? It cast out all fear. So Paul tells us that Christians will go through many trials in Romans. Sometimes we look like we defeated on earth. Nobody's. But the Christian has something powerful in his heart. His heart is beating with the love of the Trinity. And Paul tells us, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, whatever your trial is, put it in that right there this morning. He says, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to the slaughter. Not in all these things, the Christian is more than a conqueror through Christ who loved us. Isn't that amazing? Whatever your trial is this morning, I'm saying get a revelation of how much he loved you while you were a sinner. While you were doing all the wrong stuff, he called you. He shed his blood for you. He purchased you with his blood. He ain't ashamed to call you his brother. He came down and he says, my sheep know my voice. But Jesus, these don't look like your sheep. Yeah, they my sheep. They my sheep. No worry if you could deny me three times, Peter. When I die on the cross, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And you're going to love like how I love you. You see, the truth is, God wants us to know this love because it's the greater love that changes our life. Don't focus on the natural love. Focus on the supernatural love. You know, Jesus tells us about, you know, this is my commandment in John 15, verse 12 to 13. So this is what he wants us to do with the love that he's put in our hearts. Simple. Simple. One thing he tells us to do, love one another as I have loved you. And then he says, greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. You see, that's what he wants you to realize. He has the greater love, not us. The big idea here is that Jesus laid down his life for us while we were not his friends, but his enemies. Therefore... We can do the lesser part. We can lay down our lives for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. If Jesus loved you while you were an enemy, get a revelation of that love so that you can love your spouse, husbands. So that wives can love their husbands. So you can love your children. So, you can, so this love will be in his church. You know, there's been a lot of false teaching out there that's telling believers how we should love each other. And we don't get it. Like, when we move from the cross, we're moving from the power. Ain't no human being could teach us how to love like this. This is supernatural, radical love. You know, this, 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 in Mark 12, verse 31, Jesus says, we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves, right? And I've heard a lot of false teaching on this verse. Some people claim that, the reason why Christians are not loving their neighbors as they love themselves is because Christians need to be taught how to love themselves. They think that Christians need to be taught how to love themselves first, and once they learn that, then they can love others. 
They claim the reason believers are not loving their neighbors as they love themselves is because the Christians need to increase their self-esteem. They need to know about their self-worth. They need to increase their self-value. They need to love themselves. You know what that is? Psychology. <laughs> it's not the Bible. And it's so funny because pastors are preaching this. And people are turned to psychology to teach us how to love when we should be turning to the word of God. Again, this is the wrong focus. We cannot focus on our love because our love will run out. Our well will run dry. See, when Jesus says in Mark 12 verse 31, you should love your neighbor as you love yourself, Jesus assumes he, he, that everybody already know how to love themselves. If it's one thing we don't need to teach sinners is how to love themselves. <laughs> the fact that the Bible tells us we love sin more than we love God. We don't need to teach sinners how to love ourselves. We know how to love ourselves. You know, if someone was to ask you, you hungry, if you're hungry and somebody was to ask you what you feel like eating, we're going to buy what we feel like eating. We gonna, because we love ourselves. But this is, the, this is the question. When you see a beggar on the street, right, who needs food, would you give him the same meal that you would give yourself? Let's say you were hungry. You buy yourself, oh, a 20-ounce steak, $100 steak. And then you see the beggar on the street, you give him $5 for McDonald's. You see, Jesus is saying, this is what he wants us to do. He wants us to love that beggar with the same love that we would love ourselves. Take him and give him a steak. That's the radical love that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 12, verse 31. That we love like we love ourselves. So if we're going to do it for us, the same way that we would treat ourselves, treat the next person like that. And you know what we realize? We don't measure up. We don't do that. We don't love radically. We don't love like what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 12, verse 31. And we don't need to be teaching ourselves how to love ourselves to do that. We need to be re reminded of how much he loved us. That is the only way we will respond like that. You see, Jesus is telling us we need to be reminded of his love, his grace that was shown to us. We need to be reminded that we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were totally depraved. We need to be reminded that if it wasn't for the love and grace on our side, we'll be just like the beggar on the street. But Jesus wants us to see ourselves like that beggar. And he wants us to realize that God took us off the streets, man. He dressed us up. He put Jesus' robe of righteousness on us. And he brings us into the holy courts of heaven. And we're sitting down eating a meal with the Father. We don't, we, don't, we don't deserve to be in that spot. We don't deserve his love. We don't deserve his grace. That's what he wants us to get. You know, he reminds his disciples in John 15 verse 16, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should abide. I've found that in Christianity, especially in the church, the most miserable Christians, if I could use the word miserable, <laughs> are the ones who actually think that they deserve God's love and forgiveness. You see, they are like the elder son of the prodigal son. You all remember the story of the prodigal son? There was this elder son in the, in the house, and he was like, you know, look at how you treat this one who was out there splurging. The prodigal son, the father brought him in, and he gave him the fattened calf, and the elder son is mad. I never disobeyed you. I was here the whole time. You see, the problem is, a lot of Christians are like that. They think that they were the elder son in the story. But Jesus doesn't give us that parable and that story about two sons. And he's not saying that God saved the prodigal son one way and he saved the elder son another way, you know. <laughs> he's saying all were saved like how the prodigal son was saved. God found you in the pit pen. God found you and cleaned you up. God brought you into his house. 
he is, he is dealing with two different mindsets. He is dealing with one mindset who sees grace and the other mindset who sees his love for God. And the elder son didn't recognize that all things that he had was because Jesus gave it to him. That's what, that's what, that's what the father said. All things I've had, have, I've given it to you. The very fact that we have some Christians like myself who was doing a bunch of foolishness in the world and God saved me like he saved the Apostle Paul and pulled me out of the world. I understand grace. I understand light because I've been in some serious darkness. But you got some Christians who born in church. They, they, had, they had the luxury of, of, of Christian parents and, and the word of God always being preached to them. And, 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 they, and they, they grew up just thinking that this thing is natural. They didn't realize that it was supernatural. And the fact that you grew up in a house with Christian parents, the fact that you grew up in a church that preached in the gospel, and you had the Bible always by your foot, I mean always in your hand, it meant that God chose those things for you. He chose that path for you so that you could know him. And there are some people who he pull out the world and they come to know him as well. But don't ever believe salvation started with you. Don't ever believe it's because you did something. You see, it's like, it's like me asking you the question, like, how did you know the color blue was blue? When did you first learn that the color blue was blue? Well, a lot of people will never be able to give you an answer. They don't know when that happened. And a lot of Christians are like that, you know. They had the word of God given to them at a young age. They had Christian parents teaching them. And they didn't know when, when Christ came into their heart and the Holy Spirit regenerated them. It felt just natural. But I'm telling you, it's supernatural. Jesus tells us in John 3, you must be born again. There was a work that the Holy Spirit did in you when you was young. And it ain't because of anything you did. Jesus says, I chose you. You didn't choose me. You see, there's some people who can tell you the exact date of their salvation. And there's some people who don't know. But it doesn't change the way that God saves all of us. All of us were sheep that went astray. And he had to go looking for us. The very fact that he predestined certain people's lives to be in homes that they received the gospel at a young age. It's the same God who predestined the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus and brought him to his knees. All are saved the same way. So greater love has no one than this. Than, 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 than Jesus, he said, he laid down his life for us when, when, when we were sinners. And we need to get that this morning. You know, are you laying down your life to make your spouse good? Are you laying down your life in order to see Christ formed in others? Stop treating people according to what they deserve. Stop waiting on your spouse to deserve your forgiveness before you forgive them, man. That's not the way Jesus treated you. Look to God's grace and love for you. His grace and love will make you humble. You know, there are a lot of people in the church who are saved, but they still don't know how God saved them. And I'm telling you, that's very important. We need a fresh revelation of God's love and grace for us. You know, C.S. Lewis says this. He says, the Christian does not think God will love us because we're good. No. No but that God will make us good because he loves us. There's a difference. God is making us good because he loves us. And he wants us to love others with that same love. And that's why Paul spent so much time focusing on the grace and the love of God shown in salvation towards us. And then he tells us in Ephesians 5, he says, Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. So you know what I've found with the problem with a lot of Christian marriages? And, and if, if you are a, a married and in here, listen, this could save you a lot of money from going to marriage counseling. Because some of people, you just want to go to one psychology who, psychologist who could tell you some 10 steps. To, listen, it's the gospel. Save you $120 an hour. Listen to this. This is free advice. 
The reason Christian husbands do not love their wives like Christ loved the church is because they don't know how Christ loved the church. When you get a revelation of how Christ loved the church, loving your wife becomes easy. See, many Christians think that God waited on them <laughs> to call his name. Many people believe that God waited on us to choose him. I'm telling you, get a revelation of God's unconditional love for you while you are yet sinners. Take a good look at the way God saved you, man. Take a good look at that. You know, Ephesians 2, Paul is telling these Christians in Ephesus, take a good look at the way God saved you, man. You were dead in trespasses and sins, and God made you alive. You was walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, who now works in the sons of disobedience. Oh, yes, you were fulfilling the desires of your own flesh and your mind, and by nature you was a child of wrath, fitted for hell, man. You were like everybody else. But God. But God. Who is rich in mercy. Because of his great love. With which he loved us. When we were like that. When we were dead in trespasses and sins. God made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved. That not of yourselves. It is the very gift of God. Not of works. That no one can boast about it. No one can boast about the way that God saved them. Stop arguing about it. Just worship him. If this doesn't drive you to worship, then you don't get it. By grace, you have been saved. Through faith. Both the grace and the faith that's needed for salvation, it didn't come from you. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, that no one can boast about it. When you understand that you are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus, for the good work of loving others, And even these works he has prepared beforehand that we should walk in it. Even these works he has given us the Holy Spirit so that we can do it. So that we can love like he loved us. Don't wait on your spouse to deserve your forgiveness. Don't wait on them to be the first one to say, I'm sorry. God didn't wait on you. Oh, he sent Jesus Christ into the world. Sent him looking for you. He is the good shepherd that goes after the lost sheep. Let that love so change your heart, so transform your life that you could do this commandment that Jesus gives us, that you love one another as Christ has loved you. Because it's in Christ alone. It's in Christ alone who is the cornerstone. It is him alone that the weak are made strong. In the Savior's love. Through the storm. He is Lord. He is Lord of all. Amen. Father God. We thank you this morning. For your word. We thank you O oh God. That you chose us. And you didn't wait on us to get our act together. But you loved us with this love that never stops. Oh God, may you open our eyes this morning to see this great love. As the Father has loved the Son, Jesus has now loved us with that same love. May our heart beat May our heart beat with the love of the Trinity. That we can now go into a hostile world and love others like Christ loved us. 
God, you said, by this fruit of love, all men will know that we belong to you, that we are true disciples. May you use this time to conform our hearts and transform our hearts. May we look like Jesus this morning. Have your way in our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.